Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 462 of the podcast and it is the 22nd of November 2019 as I record this. So today I'm talking to Andrea Pearson about how she manages a very creative life alongside her very busy family. And if you think I get a lot done, uh, check out what Andrea has to share about her scheduling and productivity tips, including dictation, plus why she has several podcasts. And also we discuss working with our other halves, otherwise known as husband wrangling (laughs) or partner wrangling. And uh, plus some of the things we learned at the Business Masterclass in Las Vegas. We were both there together and we talk about licensing. We talk about finding time and money leaks. So that is coming up. In the Futurist segment today, I want to introduce you to my voice double. This is just the first iteration and it will improve over time as the algorithm improves and I upload more voice data. I hope you can see the possible future of voice licensing for audiobooks. Okay, it's really me talking again, and I hope that fooled you for even a split second. Uh, I think it definitely sounds like me, but you can tell by the intonation that it does have a way to go. But remember, this is the first iteration of my voice double from Descript dot uh, com. Um, it's not; it's in a beta. Not everyone can get it, and in order to make a voice double, they need certain amount of hours of. Um, Uh, material of just you speaking. So it can't even be me in conversation with someone else. It has to be my, well, basically I uploaded the audio books that I've uh, recorded. And part of the reason I think it's more deadpan is that my nonfiction audiobook recording voice, uh, you know, it's slightly different to this more uh, friendly podcasting voice. So I do, I have uploaded some more files uh, with my individual episodes in the hope that we can make it slightly less serious. <laughs> but I don't think the voice double is going to be giggling anytime soon. But it's, it, this is so interesting because when I did my AI disruption show in July 2019, within six months ago, I had talked about the things that would change in a decade. But what we've seen, like within six months, I have published books based on AI translation. And that I talked about that in the last show, the in between episode on German. And uh, you can listen to that uh, episode, whatever, 461, (laughs) the last episode before this one. And uh, also now I've got the first iteration of my voice double. I just did not think that some of these things would happen so quickly. Now, I did share a different example with my patrons earlier uh, in the week, and they had some great reactions. Jeff said, incredible, it's definitely you. It sounded like you were doing a very deliberate script read, although there were a couple of areas it was more machine-like, but still, wow. And yeah, that script read is because I am actually, my voice training data is a script read based on performing an audiobook, which is slightly different anyway. And um, Rachel says, that's amazing. It does sound slightly robotic, but it's definitely you and definitely more realistic than I was expecting to hear. So I would love to know what you think. Uh, let's get a wider response. So please leave a comment on episode 462. Just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast, click on 462, leave a comment or tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Uh, you can still email me, joanna at the creative pen dot com and um, get past my assistant, Carly, <laughs> to get a comment to me. So that is pretty cool. I hope you think that is interesting. And uh, if you haven't heard my AI show, um, I think it's 437, that show. But basically, I talk about how this type of voice synth is going to disrupt the uh, audiobook narration industry and will mean an explosion of audio content. Seriously, big explosion of audio content on the way. I'm looking forward to having that voice available so I can 
can, for example, plug it into my website so you can listen to all the many thousands of pieces of com- content that are currently not available in podcasts. Um, I'd love to be able to just plug that in. You can do this with Amazon Polly, but it takes a while. Plus, I'd rather have it in my voice, obviously. Uh, and also, yes, I do want to be able to license my voice to uh, narrate audiobooks. Now, this is some. Th- this is actually feeding into some of my thoughts on 2020. I will be doing, as ever, an end of year show and a 1st of January show when I talk about my plans. But because I want to, I think I, I do have a much stronger brand in nonfiction for my voice because this podcast has been going for a decade. So I'm going to double down on nonfiction audio in order to build up more of a voice print and a database of voice so that I can train better train an algorithm. So I need to produce more nonfiction audio in order to do that. So yeah, you can't just get one <laughs> of these. You have to have um the training data for these algorithms. That's how deep learning works and it it is fascinating. All right, so uh, moving on to my personal update, which this week I'm calling calling (laughs) nano-slow-mo. My NaNoWriMo has been a weird week. I don't know. I like. I, I just don't know how it's almost December. When I speak to you next week, it will be December. And that's just, whoa, that's mad. Uh, but it has been a weird week for me this week. I, I did some like location scouting, which is how I do my settings. Uh, settings are hugely important to me. And m- my other series, the Arcane series, um, and even my London Psychic series, of are, are, I get the ideas when I travel to a place. But Map Walkers is mainly based uh, in a fantasy split world. But I base it on places that used to be in our world and get pushed off the edge of the map, basically. And some of it's set in Bath, where I live. Um, but so I, I did some, uh, yes, scene setting research, which for me, and I just, I buy these types of books all the time. If you see, and I shared some on Instagram, but if I see Atlas of Strange Places or Atlas of Lost Cities and all of those types of books, I have a lot of those books. So what I tend to do and what I did this week, I, I blocked out sort of four hours. And it was so wonderful. And I just go through these books and I'm looking at places and thinking of ideas and I'm writing things down in my notebook. And it's very much a fantastic research process and it feels richly (laughs) self-indulgent let's say that but for me it's very important to layer these ideas in my mind and then something will come up for me and I will know that it should be set in a certain place or I'll get a plot idea based on setting or a character idea based on setting so I, I did that I did some words but not very many words and what I found is that uh as happens to me every year, December is very much my wind wind down month. January is a huge month for me. I love January. December is very sociable. I do a lot of family stuff. Uh, I have I see a lot of friends that I only see once a year. I go to author Christmas dues. <laughs> There might be a few mulled wines going around, a few gin and tonics, a few proseccos. <laughs> so, I, and also because I schedule a lot of things in advance. I'm doing a lot of work that uh, means you guys will still get content, but I can have a break. Yay! So what what this has meant this week is very interesting for me, uh, is that I haven't been able to sink down into that, what I call my JF Pen self. I feel like my Joanna Pen self is on a different level. If you think about it, uh, I, I need to sink down into the depths of myself to write as JF Pen. And I have struggled with that this week. So I'm calling it Nano Slow Mo uh, I, as ever. And I've never done that 50,000 words in Nano Momo. But what I have done is I've started back on the Audio for Authors book, which many of you have asked me for, um, which was going to be a course. I then moved it to a book. And so I'm at about now 25,000 words on that book. So what we might end up with, I may even finish the first draft of that book in November instead, just because it is coming very easily. And uh, yesterday I wrote like 4,000 words and I'm just really ramping ahead on that book. So we shall see. Uh, that Then I can call it nano non-fiction mo, which is also a thing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I might, well, it's, pff, I don't know. 
whether I will finish Map of the Impossible Draft before Christmas. I'm going to get back to it, but if I can clear the decks for November, then it means in December I can sink down a bit deeper. But yeah, I wanted to share that because um, very often for me, I don't, well, I don't write to market. I don't write to a production schedule. I just make sure that every day I have creation time and marketing time. And it evens out in the long run. You know, I make money, hopefully help you guys. I write books, uh, all good. (laughs) So if you're feeling, especially with today's interview with Andrea, that actually my little introduction is quite a good one, because if you listen to Andrea and you go, I am not that person, don't worry, you can be a bit of both. And I'm definitely a bit of both. Perhaps even that Joanna Penn is super productive and JF Penn (laughs) needs a bit longer (laughs) to produce fiction work. Uh, And since I have a non-fiction book on productivity coming out, uh, it's on pre-order, it's out 10th of December. And the audiobook uh, is also coming out. Um, That is just going through the audible process as it does right now. It should be out soon. Uh, Then yes, productivity for authors coming soon. I should say on that, and this is a little tip, um, what I've been trying to do with my last few books is release the audiobook at the same time as all the other formats. So the ebook, the paperback, large print, hardback, workbook, audiobook, all at the same time. What I will tell you is it's basically impossible to have all these things go live on the same day. What you can do is have them all kind of going live and then announce it on one particular day. So that is my plan. So even though officially it goes live 10th of December, if you are interested, you can probably find one of those formats already live. Okay, in useful stuff. Very, very cool thing this week that I had to share for those of us who write with a strong sense of place as I do. You can now create your own maps and stories in Google Earth as shared on the Google blog. With creation tools in Google Earth, you can draw your own place marks, lines and shapes, then attach your custom text, images and videos to these locations. Organise your story into a narrative, collaborate with others. When you finished your story, you can share it by clicking the new present button. Your audience will be able to fly from place to place in your custom made Google Earth narrative. Now, this just makes me want to drop everything and create my own Google Earth narratives. (laughs) Because as I said, my arcane series, my London psychic series are all based in uh, the real world. And I would love to, this just works so well with my books and travel stuff. And so I'm you know, I really want to get into this, but I have not had a go. I <laughs> just wanted to let you know that it's available. More cool, creative things to play with. And also useful, just a reminder that Mark Dawson and I are doing a webinar about reader funnels. So basically, how to sell more books by understanding where your potential readers fit in a sales funnel. So if they are very cold, they've never heard of you, you treat them a certain way. And these are the types of adver- adverts that you can use to attract them in. And then as they move down the funnel, they, you can do different types of ads. So this is a um, book marketing Uh, Amazon and Facebook advertising webinar. Um, And Mark will be going into a lot more detail and how uh, he'll also be doing a demo, hopefully, on Amazon ads. So join us Thursday, 5th of December 2019 at 3 p.m. US Eastern, 8 p.m. UK. And of course, you can register to get the replay. And if you join us live, you can chat to me behind the scenes or James uh, and John on Mark's team. Or you can also join us in the live Q&A, which we do at the end. And I probably will have a gin and tonic because it is December or after 6pm, <laughs> which is uh, my habit. Uh, so yes, join us, thecreativepen.com forward slash deck 19. So December 19th, thecreativepen.com forward slash DEC19. I probably could have done a better URL for that. Okay, so thanks for all your emails and tweets this week from Dal Cecil Runo on YouTube. Yes, I still have a YouTube channel. It is audio only, but there you go. Uh, It's The Creative Pen on YouTube. This is the podcast for me, no doubt about it. This was on the uh, David Wright show. I use all the darkness I've lived and I write that into stories. I don't like the idea of writing it into nonfiction, so I make it all fictional instead. Fantastic. Uh, 
Leanne Hunt says, I recently got back into writing and self-publishing. Your podcast got me up to speed in no time. Uh, Brilliant. Thanks, Leanne. And it's funny because I've had a few of these lately. I've had a couple of people say, oh, you know, I stopped writing in, you know, sort of four years ago and I've come back and you're still here. (laughs) I am indeed still here. Uh, Martha Dunlop says, I love this show again on how to write your darkness. It arrived just as I've been pondering self-censorship. Uh, brilliant. And uh, finally, Sally Bennett Boyington Boyington says, um, Joanna recently made a comment that hit home with me. One of the keys to writing a story that you and your readers enjoy is to focus on the ideas that bring you alive. And yeah, I think this is so important. Do not uh, just write things because you think it should be written or it, it's included in the tropes of your genre. Uh, you have to write things that bring you alive. And I'm back on ancient Egypt, which I totally love. If you're on Pinterest, I am JF Pen on Pinterest and I'm, I've got a board for Map of the Impossible and I just fall down these ancient Egyptian research holes. <laughs> love it. <laughs> So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark, who I personally use to do my print distribution outside the Amazon ecosystem. Did you know that Amazon is not the only place where people buy print books? But if you only have your print books on Amazon, then bookstores, libraries, universities, literary festivals, and other retailers will not be able to order your book. And you are missing out on a massive print market that you cannot reach if you only publish on Amazon. You can, uh, yeah, if you booksellers... (laughs) The reason why, and I I say this because a lot of people don't understand why. So booksellers make a living by buying books at a discount and then selling them for a higher price. And that is how they make income. So uh, you cannot do discounts on KDP print. So if you want to be stocked in bookstores or ordered by libraries, etc., you should have a look at Ingram Spark. You can also do different formats, including a variety of hardback editions, which I personally love. I do case-bound hardback for my books now, as well as large print and paperback um, and workbook editions and all the rest. So to be clear, you can do both. Publish on Amazon KDP Print for Amazon and also publish on Ingram Spark to go wide with your print distribution. And even if you are exclusive for eBooks, you can still go wide with print. And I really hope that uh, you guys consider this. Since joining up with Ingram Spark a few a couple of years ago now, my print sales doubled and then doubled again without doing extra marketing. And this is so important. So I have not, you know, Ingram Spark is a distributor. It's not a store. But as people hear about you through the ways that people hear about you, <laughs> they will go and ask a library or they will ask a bookstore or they will, or, they, or if you speak at a literary festival or whatever, they will want to try and order your books. And if they're not available in the right catalogues, your books cannot be bought. So yeah, I absolutely love Ingram Spark. I recommend them all the time. And uh, in celebration of NaNoWriMo, we're still in NaNoWriMo, but this code is valid for longer. Uh, you can use promotional code NaNo2020, so N-A-N-O 2020, all caps, before March 31st, 2020. So you've got a while for free title upload on print books, ebooks, or both with Ingram Spark. So that code again, NANO2020, NO2020, before March 31st, 2020 for free title upload. So if you want to give Ingram Spark a try, it is well worth it uh, with the promo code. Give it a go. So it's your content. Do more with it with Ingram Spark. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons on Patreon. Uh, And I sent out the Q&A last week as we speak now. So I hope you all found that useful. Thanks to new patrons, Liz Green, Debbie Curtis, Elizabeth Hurley, Mo Poppins and Katty or Katie. I really do appreciate your support on Patreon. It 
just means so much to me. And like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And we are heading to 500 shows at the moment. Um, So you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month. You'll get the extra Q&A audio. You also get um, money off my courses on how to write a novel and all the rest. Uh, You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get on with the interview Andrea Pearson has published 60 books under three pen names, including four books on marketing for authors. She is the co-host of the self-published Strong podcast with her husband, Nolan, and also the co-host of the Six Figure Author podcast with Lindsay Baroka and Joe Lalo. And she has three young children who she homeschools. And welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. We only saw each other like last week in Vegas, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Long time no see. Do you oh, miss me yet? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, so, but I wanted to get started because, you know, you've done incredible things since you started writing, but I'm, I'm interested, like, what's your background? How did you get into writing and indie publishing? So I didn't grow up wanting to be an author. And that's one thing I like to tell people just because so many people do. And a lot of I don't know. I've met a whole bunch of people that didn't. They're like, am I screwed? I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> so all growing up, I actually focus on art and medical things. And so, I mean, my degree is in med- in the medical field. And I mean, it's not medical, medical, you know, I'm not like a doctor, but yeah, I focus on art and medical things instead, which actually ended up helping quite a bit with my books. But I started writing when I was in college. I wrote my first book while I was working three jobs, including a full-time one and taking the maximum number of credits at my university. And I was absolutely stressed to the max, but it was my outlet. It was the only outlet I had at the time. I wasn't dating anybody. (laughs) (laughs) And so I just, I, you know, I focused on writing anytime I wasn't doing anything else. And luckily I was working, my full-time job was allowed me to do side projects when there wasn't anything going on. And so I was able to write here and there while at work. And I ended up dedicating that book to that first book to like my boss and things like that, just because they were so involved, you know, anyway, but yeah, so it was my outlet. When I finished it, I was determined, I was dismayed to find out that once you finish writing, it doesn't mean it's the end. You actually have to go and work on revising. And I had a lot of people tell me that that first book would never get published. And I was like, that's, that's inconceivable. I will not accept that. And so I rewrote it multiple times just because I wanted to make sure it was, you know, okay for um, readers. I ended up putting up on on up on on Anthonomy. Do you remember Anthonomy? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. It was um, an early kind of Wattpad, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So they're run by HarperCollins, and my book moved up really quickly. And I found an agent that way, and that agent got me like contracts, and they had an auction for a movie um, between a couple of the bigger studios, but nothing felt right. And I was a paralegal and I, at, in my former life, one of my former lives, I was a paralegal. I was say, I, <laughs> you have so many <laughs> former lives. <laughs> uh, and I ended up turning down all the contracts, including one for with the publishers of Twilight. And a lot of people thought I was insane. But when I read those contracts, I was like, this is, this is asinine. I mean, who would sign this? And I had no <laughs> idea that that was the way it was. You many know? people listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But, but I was a paralegal and I wasn't, I did not grow up wanting to be an author. And so I didn't know anything about what the contracts were like, you know? And so I ended up signing with a small press publisher and that was a good, I, it was a good and a bad idea. I mean, it was good because it gave me some footing. I found my editor through them and, um, a typesetter. And I basically was introduced to the publishing, the local publishing community, but I left them a year later, 10 days after my husband, and I got married and we've, I've been self-publishing ever since, and I've absolutely loved it. I still use that same editor from that publisher. She left them around the same time I did. And the publisher actually folded three months later. They never published any of my books. But like I said, they kind of just got me an end to the traditional publishing world. So I made a lot of contacts in the traditional publishing world, which I'm still friends with a bunch of those authors now. Anyway, so yeah, now I'm an indie author. I teach other people how to do this. And it's I absolutely love it. It's a lot of fun. (laughs) Which is fantastic. And it's interesting because, of course, you always seem to have juggled a lot of things. 
uh, in all of your jobs. Ah. This is why I really wanted to talk to you, because as we have discussed, I am very happily child free. uh, (laughs) And people ask me how I get stuff done. You have uh, obviously you have 60 books of various different lengths and you have three children who you homeschool. You have a new baby (laughs) who, as we talk, is, is sick. So how How do you juggle all of these things practically, but also without, you know, damaging your mindset as well? (laughs) Your mental health. Like, how is your mental health? (laughs) How is my mental health? I don't know. You saw me last week. (laughs) You (laughs) You you, told me. You were fine. I mean, I don't know. Is that, are you just paddling under the surface or, you know, how how do you do it? It's crazy. (laughs) So I actually, I found that because I'm such a schedule oriented person, I I work better when I'm under, you know, that whole saying, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So I've actually become more productive since having kids. I think I wrote one or two, maybe three books before I had my first. And I just, I look back at that former self, you know, and I'm like, I shake my head. I'm like, what the heck? You had so much time. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I've, I mean, kids have forced me to be more, I mean, they, I treat my time like the valuable resource that it is. And so it's actually helped me be more productive since having kids. But I found that like system schedules, system schedules, (laughs) those kinds of things really help me. And since um, we've been homeschooling since the beginning, so it's not like I'm used to having my kids go to school, you know, and so I'm not used to having that free time. And so that hasn't had been something that we had to adjust to, but I don't run a tight ship. Uh, I do like having things set in place that I follow in the same order pretty much every day. And I can, I'll I'll just talk about that really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, The baby isn't sleeping through the night right now. And so I don't wake up before the kids get up. Like when he's sleeping through the night again, and when I do have a baby that sleeps through the night, I usually get up an hour and a half before the kids get up, you know, so I can get in some extra work time, but that's not happening now (laughs) because I don't do well without sleep. (laughs) And so I get up, you know, we get dressed, we do food, we do homeschool, the baby takes a nap, and then I work for an hour to two hours, depending on how long he naps. And because I do dictate, I have found that I'm able to plow through books pretty quickly. When I'm in the revision stage, it usually takes a little bit more time. But dinner, cleaning, things like that, I do throughout the day. My husband's working right now, and we do have people come and help with cleaning uh, about once a week, sometimes just once a month, depending on, you know, how insane life is. And my husband does a whole ton. I can't ever, you know, thank him enough for he helps with cooking and cleaning and things like that and just taking care of the kids. But I've if I don't have a good system set in place, if I don't have a good schedule, if I if I don't get a lot of sleep the night before, like last night, I only got about two hours of sleep. And so, you know, I just take that day at my pace, you know, whatever pace I'm most comfortable at. And I make sure I'm doing something productive. And I know authors, I mean, everybody's going to know that there are certain levels of brain activity that you need to have in order to do certain projects and certain things. And so I just focus on those lower level, you know, the things that aren't as stressful, because I know that once I'm back to my mental peak, I can actually be a much, much faster and more productive when it comes to writing and revision. And so I don't, I'm not a daily maintenance person. I can't write every single day. I've never been able to do that. I would love to be able to do it, but I can't. And so I just, I do things in projects, you know, in in stages here and there. We also have a local store that has like this really nice lounge with, you know, chairs and things like that. I'll go there and work for a couple hours, about two times a week. Uh, I have an assistant. I work after the kids go to bed, but again, I try to get to bed by nine o'clock at night because my baby is waking up. And yeah, like I said, my husband does take over quite a bit. So it's not just me, you know. Yeah. The but ship. it's still, I mean, because, yeah, one of the biggest questions, of course, is how do I find the time to write? And, you know, with with your life, you're still finding time. So just on the schedule, so you mentioned there a sort of few hours. How do you manage that schedule? Do you use something like, I use Google Calendar, for example, and things like Calendly, like, you know, we're, we book this on Calendly, an, an app for booking time. Do, do you actually do it like that? Do you have a, you know, like a calendar on the wall or, you know, because to manage, you know, you and your husband and three children as well with their various, I'm sure they have play dates and other things, mm-hmm. you know, how do you manage all of that, like on a practical level? I have, I have several systems depending on which phase of child I'm working with. So right now, I, you know, the kids are younger, so we don't spend a lot of time in my office. My kids generally will play around me and they're very content. I've raised them to be super independent. And so I don't 
play with them. I play with them once a day, pretty much. And then I'm like, nope, this is how my mom raised me. You're going to be independent. <laughs> so <laughs> Mine <they> too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, they don't rely on me for their entertainment. And so they, they'll they play around me. But like in my office, I've got a dry erase board and I go by weekly schedules. I don't go daily because daily is too hard to predict with kids. But if I, I go weekly, you know, there's almost always a day or two where I can knock out pretty much all of my to-do list. And so I keep on my dry erase board, I'm looking at it right now, I've got writing and publishing and a list of stuff I want under there. I've got business. And so business would be, you know, like if I need to buy stock photos or email and things like that. And then I've got personal. And so, and then I just move them along to the, down to the, to do the, the, the section where I'm currently working on them or the done part of my dry erase board. If I'm down in the, in the living area, I've got a calendar set up on my, on my fridge. It's not like a, it's not like a month to month and a day to day calendar. It's just a list of the current books I'm working on and what days I need to actually have started the revision process or the outlining process or the dictating process. I do that a lot. I also keep those kinds of things on my phone. I use a galaxy note eight and I know it's not the latest version (laughs) of the notes, but (laughs) it works. And I just, I use that stylus pen quite a bit. I'll like screenshot the calendar and then I know later versions you can actually write on the calendar, but I'll sit and outline, you know, on my phone what times I need to do things and and when I need to have them done. I, I'm a huge fan of to-do lists. I love the process of actually physically writing. I found that using it on the computer takes away that that part of the brain that it gets engaged for me. And so I found that writing on the dry erase board or writing on a piece of paper or writing on my phone or whatever, that helps cement it into my brain and it's easier for me to actually do it. Occasionally I'll buy those big calendars, you know, the really mm. like, Yeah, yeah, like massive ones. I, yeah. 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 And I'll keep that by my desk and then I'll, you know, work ahead and then I'll put down again the same things like when do I need to start dictating to get the book done in time? When do I need to start revisions and things like that? When is it due to my editor? And I think a lot of authors are the same. We're obsessed with papers and pen. And so if I have multicolor pa- uh, pen av- pens available, then I'm able to be more productive for some reason. I don't know why, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just that that creative side of my brain in the outlining and the working, you know, the the more tedious part of the process. Yeah, well, a, a couple of points there. I mean, you clearly, obviously, you get a lot done, but you are spending some time scheduling and planning to get stuff done, as opposed yeah. to you're not just going, oh, you know, maybe I'll get up tomorrow and have a bit of time to write, and maybe I'll do something. I might make it up at the time. I mean, you're planning your time, you know, pretty hardcore, right? Yeah, like I said, it's the it's the week to week. So the days in and day out, like I can't do that super like because my baby has the flu right now. So I can't, you know, say this day I have to do this because I'm not going to make it, you know, mm-hmm. but I am pretty strict when it comes to the weeks, you know, and my husband is 100 percent like a, a bajillion percent on board. And so he's very supportive of this. So he'll frequently come home from work and say, hey, what do you need done and what do you need me to do and things like that. And so that helps a lot. But if I don't schedule, if I'm not at least a little bit of a schedule Nazi, if I don't value my business time, then nothing gets done because there's so there. I mean, you know what it's like. You run a house. I mean, there's so much that can be done all the time. In our house, we built this house. It's only a year and a half old, but there's still there's so many projects that need to be done. And so if I'm if I'm not careful, if I don't schedule, if I don't have things written down where I can see them visually as a reminder, like I said, on the fridge, you know, or mm. on my office wall, then things just don't happen. Yeah, I get it. I am I mean, I'm a scheduler. I like to do lists. I do all these things too. I think you have to have those things. This is really important, people. You cannot keep everything in your brain. You just can't. Mm-hmm. I mean, you literally cannot. <laughs> You're not in junior high anymore. Your brain does not have that elasticity anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, more that I think we expand our life, you know, and yeah. especially as independent authors, it's not just the writing. There's the publishing task, the marketing task, the business stuff, the, you know, everything. And and mostly each book is in a different stage of what's happening. You know, like I was writing this morning, I met my, you know, going to the cafe and doing novels this afternoon. You know, I've got three German books coming out tomorrow nice. and I did some audiobook publishing for another book. So it's like three different projects at the same time at different phases of project management. And that's yeah. what we are, isn't it? We have to be creative, but also a project manager. 
Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. So let's talk about dictation because you seem to have cracked the code on dictation, which is something I, I mean, I listen to you and be like, okay, I want to be like Andrea. <laughs> so <laughs> tell, how does this writing, how does the dictation and writing process work f- for you? That, I- explain that first because the speed is incredible. Okay. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty fast at dictating, but if I don't have things set up first, then I don't, I'm very slow at dictating or, Mm. you know, it's, so what I have to do is I brainstorm for a while, the series, and sometimes that'll be like five years. And sometimes that's five minutes, (laughs) not five minutes, like five hours, literally, because if you're on contract, you know, you can't, you know, you can't just not brainstorm a series. You actually have to produce something. And so I I'll, if I have lots of time, I just let it germinate in the background while I'm working on other things. But if I don't have a lot of time, I actually have to force myself. And the way I do that is I go for walks, you know, movement equals productivity for me. And a lot of people, I chew on it, sugar-free gum <laughs> that <laughs> helps. And I outline, I'm, I'm not huge into outlining anymore. In the beginning, I used to do 50,000 word outlines. Whoa, um, I, that's a novel. Yeah, it is. It pretty much is. And I know there's other authors who do it that way, but it's, and that's kind of how I used to have to do it because I didn't trust myself when I actually started writing that I would know how to do it, you know? And so when I was outlining, I would write down things that occurred to me now that I'm dictating. And now that I've written, you know, 60, whatever books, I, I trust myself. I know that once I get into the dictating process, I'll still have the same brain and the same creativity <clears throat> excuse me. And so I will, my outlines aren't very extensive anymore. I usually just do a bullet point for an, a, a scene and I try to aim for, you know, between 25 and 50 bullet points. That'll make up about a 50 to 60,000 word book. And I'm not huge into description. My books are pretty fast moving and there's not, you know, they're very heavy plot heavy, but not a lot of description. And so I have to make sure that my outline has enough scenes under each bullet point. Otherwise I get stuck in the dictating process when I realize I'm not going to make my goals. And so then after I do all of that, and it usually takes me about a day, sometimes two days to outline a a full novel. Now I dictate it. And in the beginning, when I first started dictating and well, okay. So backtrack. Um, The reason I started dictating was because I was forced to, I broke a finger and it tore ligaments and I, I still have a hard time typing. It's been three or four years now and it still hurts to type if I do it for a long time. And so I had to dictate. I was, I was one of those forced to dictate type people. And now that I do it, I absolutely love it. But when I first started out, I was, you know, the revisions when you're dictating, depending on how good your setup is, it can, they can be pretty hard, you know, pretty difficult to get through. And in the beginning, that was the case with me. My, my dictations are usually 90 to 95% correct, but there's that five to 10% that really throws me sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so it would take me a long time to revise. And what I ended up doing, and this is how I have it worked up now. I, I emailed my list and I asked for volunteers and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to pay somebody $50 per manuscript to go through what I've dictated and make it sound like English. Because one of the things about me is I stutter a bit when I'm thinking. And if I don't know where I'm going ahead of time, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, you know, like that. And Mm. so I try to figure out exactly what, what I'm saying, but when I'm dictating, I don't always have that luxury. And I had a, I had like 200 people respond back saying they wanted to do it. And I ended up going with somebody who has read every single book I've written and she's paid for every single book I've written. And she knows my universe, my universe is inside and out. And so she goes through and she makes them sound like English. And, you know, she removes those little bits of stuttering. And, um, I know some dick people who dictate, fantasy, they'll put in a substitute word. My, this reader, she knows my world's world well enough where she knows when I'm trying to say arete, it means arete, not are they here or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so she'll go through, yeah. And she'll go through and just make sure it sounds like English. And she usually gets those back to me within 24 hours, which is phenomenal because it would take me, you know, cause I get stuck in the plot rather than just English, Englishizing it. And then that first round of revisions is still the hardest, but that's okay. Because at this point, you know, it's, I don't know, like my first, my first round of revisions when I was typing was still difficult, but they're, they're manageable now. And it takes me about, I do five pages a day. It takes me about 20 days and I can get through, you know, a novel that way. And I do my second revision. I do an out loud revision. I don't read my books out loud because I dictate so much. I I try to save my voice. And so I use a program called natural reader. It's free. You can upgrade for like 80 bucks, (laughs) but (laughs) The free version is fine. It it just reads it out loud to me. And then when I'm done with that, I I don't use beta readers anymore. I used to, but I found that it just got to the point where 
I wasn't using their suggestions anymore. And I, I'm, I edit on the side. I don't anymore, but I did in the past. And so I understand grammar enough, you know, not to need people to tell me how to, to write. They just catch, <laughs> you know, little typos here and there. Mm. But so I don't use a beta reader anymore. Instead, I send straight to my editor. And by the way, she didn't even notice when I stopped using, using beta readers. I didn't tell her. I just started sending to her and she didn't even notice. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's good. And I then think, uh, just on that, I think that's a confidence thing. Uh, I think when you are a new writer, you need people to almost tell you that things are OK. And yes. then as you as you write more books, you're like, yeah, I know how to do this. And, exactly. You know, I yeah. just need a professional to do the thing that professionals do. <laughs> exactly. And you know what your weaknesses are. You know what your your strengths are. You don't need somebody saying, hey, you know, and a lot of the time, like because you've been doing it long enough, you recognize where there's going to be holes in the plot. And so if you need that, you know, you can ask your editor, you know, to look through it or you can have one or two writer readers and just say, hey, is this a problem? You or, know, or you can read it through and fix it yourself which I exactly. think is where we get to. Like, I know there is a problem and I know how to fix it. How to fix it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So sorry, finish the, the process. Yeah, the process. So she, so my editor gets through it. She usually takes about four days. She gets it back to me. And this is the same editor from the publishing company. She's an author and she like writes two novels a month. And so she doesn't take on clients. <laughs> <laughs> She's fantastic. <laughs> But and then after she's done, I send it to my my review crew, which is like a street team. Right. And mm. they I, they look for typos. And I've got some really good eagle eye readers on there and they'll find spare typos. And I usually tell them, please get it back before, you know, before the book is published. And sometimes I'll do like an incentive, like if you read it before the day it comes out and get those typos to me, then I enter them into a giveaway. And that's not based on reviews. That's based on whether they read the book, you know, and so mm. it's not illegal. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, that, I think that's fantastic. So I think the key, because I have, uh, I am sporadic with dictation, but it's, as you say, the I can't, like right now I'm doing the beginning stages of NaNoWriMo. I don't know what this book is. And I cut, so I, you know, I could turn on my dictation, my Sony little recorder, and I don't know what to say. So it's, yeah. it's like, like you say about the outlining for me, discovery writing and, and research is kind of part, a much bigger part of my, my process and what I almost, what I love about it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so it's, I think for people listening, that, that is the key. You basically know you've put down even just a few bullet points or 50 bullet points or whatever, but you have an outline. So when you turn it on, you know what to say. That's the problem with dictation. You have to know what to say. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I had, I mean, I struggled with that quite a bit in the beginning and something I found that helped for me was I would print off pictures of like, if I knew I had to describe a house, I would find a house that looked like what I wanted to do. Or I mean, wanted the house to look like, and then I would describe that. And I found that seeing something visual helped give me that the grounding that I needed to go off to actually start the dictating process. And so I don't need to do that anymore, but um, that's something that really helped me in the beginning. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I do that. Like once I know kind of what's going on, I do the same thing. I'll look for a scene uh, where I'm going to set the scene and, and bring up pictures on the computer and stuff. So good tips there. So I want to move on because you have this case. Okay, so you have two podcasts for authors, the new, as we t as we record this six figure author podcast uh, with Lindsay Broker and Joe Lalo, which is great. Highly recommend that one. And also self published strong podcast, which is you and also uh, sometimes your husband. And you have another one for your readers right as well yeah. which is kind of crazy you're, you're kind of a nutcase <laughs> I mean I have two podcasts but I don't write as much and, I, and like I feel like a slacker um next to you but I wondered like what the hell like why what what part does podcasting play in your author life like it can't just be for book sales because I know it's a long game yeah. is it for community like why do so much audio it's mostly for community. I mean, I'm home with my kids all day. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I like my podcasts, they they allow me to, you know, reach people, even if it's sometimes one way one sided, like with my, my fiction podcast, which by the way, I record in spurts and stages, I don't do it every week. <laughs> I'll do like batches, which I think is what you do, isn't it? You do batches, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. The the self published strong podcast I do with my husband, he I mean, that one is, 
it's based off of our passions. Like we're both movie people. And so we, we watch movies and we, we give writing tips based off of, you know, great and awful movies. And that's just a lot of fun. We, I mean, we make fun of movies all the time anyway. So we decided to just turn it into a podcast and then it talks about marketing and publishing, which are things that I'm passionate about. And so I don't, you know, and I haven't been doing them as long as you, Joanna, I mean, for crying out loud, <laughs> I mean, my self-published strong podcast has been going for almost two years now, but it's, you know, it, I haven't yet reached that point where I feel like it's taking a whole ton of time yet. Also, I did hire my brother. He's a sound engineer and he does all of the edits for me on both podcasts, actually this one and the six figure authors one. But I just, I do it to connect with people like, you know, the six figure author podcast. I get to hang out with Joe and Lindsay on a weekly basis and then the one with my husband, it's, it's kind of like a date, you know, we we actually have this set aside time where we know we get to talk to each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, and I don't, I mean, I make money off of my one podcast, the self-published strong podcast when I'm running a, like a discount or a coupon on my courses, but that's not the reason I started it and it doesn't pay for itself yet, you know? Mm. And so it's just mostly for community. It's just, it's just something I absolutely love doing. And you're the reason I started podcasting. So you have <laughs> You to blame. <laughs> well, but, well, then I'm really glad because, you know, obviously I'm, I, I think podcasting was, I mean, obviously writing books is amazing, but podcasting changed my life in so many ways. And like you say, it's community. I started podcasting, you know, back in 2009 because I didn't have any friends in the author space. Like I didn't oh. know anyone. And the only way to do it is by like, oh, hey, how about I interview you? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's cool. And also, you know, y yeah, you meet people and you kind of, ne it's a net, it's a network. And I'm so yeah. glad you said that because so many people start podcasting because they think it's going to make money, but it's yeah. not, is it really? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. I mean, not for most people. It's just, and, but, but it's like a roundabout thing. And so one of the things I get most from listeners is the pay it forward thing. You know, they, they're willing to help out with something because they feel like I'm helping them out with something. And so, and, and so that's networking and that's, you know, it, it's just, it's very roundabout and it takes a long time. You know, it's not something you should start off thinking that you're going to be making money because it's free. Nobody's buying the podcast unless you have an audience and use a Patreon thing, you know? Mm. And so, yeah. Like my wonderful patrons. Thank you, patrons. <laughs> but, but also, you know, I did it for what, six years before I monetized. So, you know, things are, things are different, but I'm, I'm really glad you talked about that. But I also want to ask about your, your husband, Nolan, and you do, like you said, the self-published strong date podcast. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is something interesting. So you said he has, he has a, a day job, but also helps you with lots of things. And obviously he's into all of this stuff. I've been husband wrangling since, <laughs> 2015 when my husband left his job to join the business but I uh, I call it wrangling cuz you know really realistically the things that you might expect your husband to do are not uh, usually you want to get rid of the things you don't want to do <laughs> and sometimes the husband doesn't want to do the things that you want him to do <laughs> speaking from personal experience so I would like um any tips for not just obviously people listening may have husband, wife, 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 whatever they are, um, but tips for working with loved ones. A lot of people like work with their children as well, for example. Yeah, exactly. I think in, in our case, uh, especially with, you know, a spouse, it's there's there's this whole the, the respect, you know, we can't treat our husbands like employees because that's not what they are. They're partners. And so I'm I tell him I'm like, whatever you want to do, what he does, he does all my Amazon ads. And, um, he's also started writing in the last year or so. So he's, you know, he's actually a phenomenal writer, but I didn't actually expect him. We actually talked about this. What was it like a week ago? Right. When, mm. when you're like, my husband doesn't want to write. I'm like, I didn't know my husband wanted to write until, you know, like he's a creative though, you know? And so mm. anyway, so just patience. Um, don't, I don't treat him like an employee and I know you're, you're the same. You know, we talked about this two years ago at the first business masterclass we were at together. I, you know, we, we work with their strengths. He's, he's a really smart guy. I know your husband is, does a lot of data science stuff as well, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My husband does a lot of data science. And so I take him, I hand him off problems. I'm like, this is a problem I'm having. How can, how can I fix it? You know? And he's, he's got a brain. He can see things from the outside and tell people what, where their problems are and how to fix it. And that's been a huge benefit for me. 
And then I just let him, I just give him free reign. You know, I mean, his, our goal is for him to quit in May and he is, and he's writing now, but he's also just, he's doing a whole bunch of other stuff too. Like he has illustration clients and things like that, that he's doing work for. And I just let him do where his own creative brain takes him. Like he doesn't tell me, you know, I mean, he's like, well, if you wrote in this genre, we'd probably make more money, but he doesn't tell me I have to do that, you know? And so it's pretty much the same with him. Like things that he enjoys doing, I just let him take the reins on and the boring stuff, you know, the things that I was like really hopeful that he would take over in the beginning. I have my assistant do now and she, she lives across the country for me and I can tell her what to do without having any problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It's basically respecting what they want to do with their life as opposed to, oh, great, you're joining the business here's all the things I don't want to do. (laughs) (laughs) And I totally agree with you. And and in fact, sometimes it's surprising. Like my husband was the one who really put our investment strategy into place. And I can, I can, I know how to make money, you know, but I had not learned to keep money and invest money. Oh yeah. That's my (laughs) husband too. (laughs) Yeah. So now I'm like, now, you know, we're in a much better, better position than we would have been because of a sort of high level decision making process that I am too in the day to day to yeah. to kind of come up with. So this and and that was surprising. So I think that it is a real tip to just kind of, well, freedom to roam and not expect them to be a carbon copy of who we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's and fantastic. They, I mean, sorry. We, yeah, sorry. We marry people who compliment us in a lot of ways. And mm. so I mean he's gonna be able to take over or she, you know, whoever can take over things that maybe you might be weak at and don't recognize, you know? And so, I mean, he, like I was saying, he sees things that I can't see. And like you said, the day to day, I'm stuck in the, where the rubber meets the roll, you know, the road, the daily grind stuff. And he's separate from that. And so he's able to be more impartial. And and one thing they hit on at the the masterclass was eliminating leaks. You know, he's great at doing that. You know, he's like, okay, so how much time are you spending on this? How much money are you spending on this? Uh, can we you know, adjust that? Can we fix that? And my husband's a natural saver. I'm a natural saver, but I didn't learn how to be a natural saver until I married him. And he is, he's, you know, he's fantastic with managing the finances of things. And so that's been, that's been huge for us. Yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, you mentioned you've mentioned the masterclass a couple of times, and we were there last week. And I I was going to do, I, and in fact, I'm going to point people to the six figure author podcast because I just listened to the first half of your double show about it. So people have been asking me to do a whole show on it, and I was going to, but th- I have so much going on in my brain that I just can't. <laughs> I can't do it. I look at my 40 pages of A4 and kind of go, I just know I'm just not ready to tackle it. So I wondered, you know, since you have managed to put a podcast together on this, so you've actually been able to process uh, things, were there any sort of aha moments or things that were surprising, like not, you know, because lots of things are covered at Nink at 20 books to 50K, you know, all the lots of stuff is covered elsewhere. But I find the business masterclass to be challenging at a kind of different level. So were any, any aha moments or things that you particularly went, yeah, that was worth coming for? Yeah, I mean, this year they focused completely on licensing. And one of the things they said right off the bat was don't think of your products as books, think of them as ideas and that you can, which, which have multiple things, including books that you can license. And so, you know, just looking at the broader picture, I mean, can you do audiobooks? Can you do merchandise? Can you do, you know, escape rooms and what else was there? Games and all, I mean, there's just so many different things that you can license from that one specific idea, video, you know, streaming videos and things like that, YouTube videos. And that was, that was one of those aha moments for me. And then again, eliminating leaks, you know, time leaks and money leaks and all of that. That was hugely beneficial to me. Let's see what else was there. There was That's- there was so much. Well, I'll just comment on, on those two things. So the licensing thing I thought was interesting because it was very much about consumer product licensing. So the show in Vegas is consumer products, whereas I was at Frankfurt Book Fair, which is all about, you know, foreign rights licensing and things like audio and other stuff like that. So this was a kind of step beyond just the licensing that many indies do. For example, <laughs> when I was chatting with someone, they were like, oh, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not necessarily going to do products. And they were like, why? why have you not done a creative pen? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, why do you not work with a pen 
uh, someone who makes pens, like a pen manufacturer, yeah. you know, I could do that. Like that's an example. It doesn't, because it, like you said, it's not just necessarily a book, it's ideas or brands that you own and control. Yeah. And the creative pen brand of which I have books, but I also, it has other things that could be associated with it or with my books, many, pretty much all my characters have tattoos. I don't have tattoos personally because I c- couldn't possibly decide on one, but pretty much all my characters <laughs> have different tattoos. And I'm like, well, you know, I could, you, you, what about, you know, t-shirts with tattoo designs on that are part of my books or yeah. actual tattoos that you can get from those printable tattoo sites, not ones that you actually get done like, like, these are just some ideas but it, it was kind of beyond books wasn't it yeah yeah and one thing that I really liked that they talked about was don't merchandise things like your series name or t- or you know the name of a book merchandise things that your characters would want to wear because those are things that your readers are going to want to wear and so like the tattoo idea is fantastic because if your character wears it which they do then readers would be more likely to as well you know mm. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah, like, yeah, and that's a bit uh, I got out of it too. The other thing that hit me was this power, power differential that the licensor, the person who owns the intellectual property, uh, has in the relationship. And we're so used to in publishing, we're so used to being the ones going cap in hand to publishers, whereas this was very much the other way around. It was, no, you are in the power position as the IP controller, the intellectual property holder, and people who want your brand and your ideas will come to you. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and you, you do, you own all the car, you have all the cards. You're, you're the one that's in charge. And that that's another thing that they talked about was how, when you go to like licensing expos, it's different from Hollywood. Hollywood's out there to grab everything and they take advantage and they exploit and everything. But when you go to these licensing conventions and things, people who do games and, and all of these different things, they actually want to have it be mutually beneficial. And so they're, they want to make you happy. They want to work with you. They want you to get what you want. And so it's not, I mean, of course they want to get the most out of it as possible, but it's not something where they're trying to take advantage, you know? And I absolutely love that. I, I think that's a fantastic way to look at it because authors were, were nervous when it comes to, and, And again, it's the way we've been browbeaten, you know, we're nervous when it comes to our licenses and our IPs and things like that. And it doesn't, we don't need to be, you know. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And then the time and money leak, I agree, I think that was interesting. And I kind of know that, but since we're, we're, I think we're quite similar characters in our sort of get stuff done um, sense. And sometimes I look back, especially because my husband makes these sort of strategic statements every now and then, and then goes back to what I sometimes perceive as doing nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I'm like, okay, that was a big strategic statement. And then you're completely right. And I have just spent a whole month doing something probably I shouldn't have done. (laughs) Yeah. And I found that that? Yeah, no. And I'm, I'm a really loyal person. And so once I sign up for a service, I have a really hard time cutting it because especially (laughs) if I know the owners of the service, you know, and I'm, I, I ended up just at, you know, canceling my subscription to a service that where I know the owner because I haven't used it in, you know, two years. And what's the point? I mean, our, our relationship does not have to be money based, you know? And so I don't need to continue you know, providing money to some a service that I don't use anymore just because I I like the owner, you know? Ooh, that's a good one. And that that to me is a time, uh, sorry, is a money leak. Yes. And money leaks, especially now with software as a service. So these monthly recurring payments that maybe when yes. you signed up, you were like, oh, it's only five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month. And then as you say, a year later, you're like, that, that was like $120 and I haven't yeah. used it. So there's a good a direct tip for people, like go through your what you're signed up to and cancel stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just an, an exa- another example of, of time leak there. Anything that came up for you around time leaks? Because that was an example of a money leak. So time leaks would be things that little things that I could be that I do that I could hand off to my assistant, you know. And so, you know, there's things. And again, does she need to even be doing them? There are things that don't matter that just they don't produce results and you do them because it's either fun. You know, you know, there's certain projects that I like to do that are a waste of time that I could enjoy doing something else even more. I actually like data and gathering things like that. And I just, I hand that off to my assistant now because there's no reason why I should be doing those things. And then again, if it's something that's not going to be beneficial, 
then she shouldn't even be doing them, you know? And then just like my newsletter list, just little random things here and there that I know I need to do, but that are difficult for me to do. So I have my assistant set up my weekly newsletter. She'll upload pictures of my kids and I, I share pictures of my kids. I share funny things that my kids say with my readers and she uploads those every single week. She's the one who uploads if I'm doing newsletter swaps. You know, I just, I have her do those things because those are technically time leaks for me when I could be having somebody else do them instead. Mm-hmm. Um, and then specifically from the conference, I I don't know, honestly, just researching things that I know I'll never do. You know, there's, there's certain things in marketing that I know would probably be beneficial, but I know I will never have time to do it. So why even research it, you know? other than to help other people. Well, here's a question then, because this is something, you know, I've been, this year was a kind of year of learning for me and I I didn't speak at conferences. I went to conferences and this Vegas conference was very expensive for me financially. Uh, Health-wise, it was very expensive. (laughs) Um, I was sick and I got home and I was sicker and I I had a lot of, I had a lot of sickness and it, it, it cost me, it cost me in time and, but, uh, you know, it was well worth it. And many of those ideas, I think for me, the reason I can't do a show on it is because there's such big ideas that I need time to really consider the impact on my business uh, and what, how I want to go forward. Now, so this idea of how we spend our time and how we spend our money. Like, as you said, you went to the, you went to Vegas, you have children, you know, how, how do you justify spending time on conferences, which also costs you money because you could have been writing more books or whatever. So for people listening who worry about going to conferences like this, you know, is it worth it? This conference is, I, I, that's again, a time leak. I used to participate in a local conference. They would have me come and present and I did it every single year. We would pay for my, my mother-in-law to fly down and to stay with the kids. And it was, it was a literal time leak because their audience was the people who attended the conference were authors who were just starting out and they would want me to, they would want to hire me for cons- consulting and things like that. But I like the kinds of things they needed my help with were things that they could get pretty much anywhere just by doing a, sim- a simple Google search. And I just, I looked at it. And I was like, this is not, this is not a benefit for me time-wise. And so I stopped doing those those conferences. And the only conference I do right now, and I generally only do one a year just because again, it is time and would I be better off writing? Uh, the only conference I do now is for now is the, you know, the business masterclass that Dean and Chris put on. And the reason it's worth it to me is because they're the, there's such a heavy emphasis on the networking, you know, and that first year I attended, I met you, I met Mark, you know, uh, Lefebvre, I met Damon Courtney was not there that year. I met him last year. I met Lindsay Baroker and Joe Lalo. And I mean, there's just, I mean, the value that has come from that first conference is it's huge. You know, I've, I've made a lot of really good connections because of that, but then I've gone every year since, because it's also, it's not just who I can, I meet, it's also who I can help. And I find a great deal of pleasure and in being able to help other people. And because this conference is geared more towards advanced writers, I can go and teach marketing and know that they're going to better implement what I'm teaching and that they're in a better position to implement it. And so it's satisfying the itch that I have to, you know, teach people and to help people further their businesses while also satisfying a social itch. You know, I get out of the house for a week at a time and I get to go and hang out with like-minded people. And it's also good for me because I'm networking with, again, like-minded people. And so that's, I mean, this conference is definitely has been worth it. And I, I do say people should be attending it, but they limit it. So not everybody listening can go. <laughs> mm, and again, it's about where you are and there are different conferences for different people in different places. And it's more about the what what you consider. And I mean, you definitely went above and beyond. I, I you know, came at the end of one of your mar- evening marketing sessions and boy, you you. <laughs> You were given you were given a lot of advice and working very hard. So like kudos to you. But we are we're pretty much out of time. But I did want to mention because you do have fantastic advice on marketing. So just tell people about your maybe just talk about what's at self published strong in terms of resources and, and courses and stuff. Yeah, so self published strong.com is the umbrella um, website. 
and it has my podcast and things like that there. If listeners want to go to self publish strong courses.com, that's where all my marketing courses are. I've got, I don't know how many, um, I've got one on finding reviews and subscribers and my automation sequence one, which talks, it gives examples of every location, pretty much where you can find readers and the sorts of automation sequences that they should go through before you start sending them weekly things. And again, this is all just, this is subjective. It's stuff that I recommend. It's not what everybody should do, but yeah, they can go to self strong courses.com to learn more about my courses. And I've got a, a coupon code uh, for listeners. That's 30% off on all of my marketing courses, which I mean, the prices, they're not huge. They're $5 to $50. And so it's not, you know, a huge money investment anyway. Um, but that coupon code is yellow because yellow is a color. Everybody knows. <laughs> Ca- uh, capital letters or lowercase? I don't know if it matters. I always tell people to just do capital. It's teachable. I don't know. Do you know if teachable cares? I haven't got a clue, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yellow. And I mean, certainly given what we've been talking about, automation sequences, anything that will speed up systems and processes and, you know, to help us get more done, that is just fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So where else can people find you and everything you do since you do so much? <laughs> I don't really like social media. I mean, I hop in there every now and then. So I generally, I mean, people can follow me on Facebook. They can join my group. It's it's a group called BookBub Promotions and More. It's I don't update it regularly. It's mostly there as a resource for people who want help with marketing and things like that. They can just go and ask the group. But my my regular places are my podcasts, the Six Figure Authors Podcast, if you like money and publishing stuff in general, and self published Strong Podcast, if you like movies and marketing and, and learning about publishing and marketing tips and things like that. Those are basically the the guaranteed, the regular ones. I mean, people can always email me or- Your fiction, and my Andrea, everywhere. your fiction. <laughs> My fiction. Are our <laughs> are, are listeners gonna care about my fiction? Well they might. They wanna have a look that you know what you're talking about. It's like, well, oh, what yes, has this woman true. written? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so not used to talking about my fiction books to authors. I'm I just generally discredit, you know, them as potential anythings. <laughs> so I mean, you can find me on Amazon. My website is andreapearsonbooks.com. One of my courses teaches how to get uh, reviews on autoplay. Um what is it? Is it autoplay? Is that the word? Yes. <laughs> yeah, set it, set it and forget it tactic again, sleep deprived. <laughs> but um, and the book that I've been focusing mostly on is Shade Amulet. And if if listeners want to go and see um, about 40 of the reviews on Shade Amulet came from my review crew and the rest have come from my autoplay methods. My auto is that that is not the word, is it? <laughs> Autoresponder? Autom- <laughs> my autumn like it's just, yeah, autoresponder. I mean, it is my automation sequence. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> just to set it and forget it thing. I don't even have to think about it. It's constantly getting me a steady stream of reviews coming through. But yeah, so go check me out on Amazon. That's where most of my my reviews are, you know, because that's where most everybody's reviews are, because that's where a lot of downloads are. <laughs> but and and you can see that I do know what I'm talking about. I don't I mean, if you look at my my marketing books, I do have books for authors available. Uh, I don't focus on them. I don't, you know, I don't have very many reviews on them because I generally forget that I do nonfiction stuff as well. Um, but if you look at my fiction stuff, you can see where I've put into practice what I what I teach, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're a force of nature, Andrea, and uh, <laughs> you definitely teach me things. So I highly recommend Self Publish Strong and the Six Figure Author Podcast and, and lots more to learn there. So thanks so much for your time, Andrea. That was great. Yeah, no thing, no problem. And yeah, it was a lot of fun hanging out with you again. Uh, we should do this more often, like yearly at the business masterclass. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a brat. I apologize. <laughs> So I hope you found the interview with Andrea useful today and that you got some tips on how to manage your time more effectively. So I learn a lot from Andrea. Uh, And for more tips, check out the Six Figure Author podcast uh, that Andrea does with Lindsay Broker and Joe Lalo. They talk about some quite different things than I do because they are different authors. And I listen to that show. I find it um, super interesting. So next week, I'm talking about how to effectively work from home with Amanda Brown, the homepreneur. Now, I started working from home in 2011 when I went full time as a writer. And Amanda's been doing it for over 20 years. And uh, we talk about some of the positives, but also some of the pitfalls and how you can work from home more effectively, how to get over some of the guilt and the things that inevitably happen around um, 
transition and also partners and how you can make the most of that time and not go completely nuts. (laughs) There is a lot to navigate. So whether you are thinking about transitioning or you are doing it part time or you've just started out and you want to improve it, then definitely check in for that interview. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.